One of them says this, when a person does not adhere to the rules, he fails to perform his duties properly. But a disciplined person definitely achieves success. Makes sense. Way of works. We're going to be singing songs about we need to adhere to the rules. We need to perform our duties. The Yajur Vedas, collection of mantras. You know mantras? You're supposed to have your individual mantra and it's something that you could say to kind of be calm, right? Like, the Chiefs are the best team in the NFL. The Chiefs are the best team in the NFL. It's something that calms us. Don't shake your heads. Don't be messing with my mantra. That's right. So you say things in a religious way, you know, kind of collect, connected to, we all know this from Hinduism, right? Om, Om. These things are supposed to be very calming. So the Vedas have a section devoted to mantras. Short, specific verses to be recited by priests during the rituals. One of these mantras, for instance, uh, you, you chant and you perform a ritual with that tr- chanting and you give offerings of cow milk and grains to a special fire. You put them in and you, you recite this mantra and this ritual is supposed to give you a long life. It's supposed to give you security, tranquility, and contentment. The Sama Veda, priestly songs and chants. I'm guessing on some of these uh, pronunciations, by the way. Artharva Veda, and incantations. Is that better? Okay. Magic spells and incantations. So, if you're a Hindu, maybe you caught. Some, some little lass or lad caught your eye. You're going to turn in your Veda to... You're going to go to the priest and you're going to ask the priest to make a special spell so that you can gain her or him as your lover. This section of the Veda has charms against diseases. This section of the Veda has, has a, some verses that say this. Let... Marrow be put together with marrow and joint together with joint, together with the flesh fallen apart, together sinew and together bone. Let marrow come together with marrow, let bone grow over together with bone. We put together your sinew, your sinew. Let skin grow within skin. If you're sick, a priest will come to you and he will chant that. And magically you would be better. And so, if you're a priest, I don't know what this dude is doing. But if, if you're a priest, you're going to specialize in one of, those, one of those sections of the Veda. And if you're a priest, you're a pretty big deal. Everything goes through the priests because the Aryans, as they came and they take, took over northwest India, they also brought probably one of the most tragic elements of Hinduism, uh, the caste system. This is a hierarchy this is a, these are different levels of society. And at the top, we, we, we might want to adopt this part of it anyway. At the very, very tippy top of society are the preachers. Okay? Should we put that in? Okay, maybe not. Um, preachers, the priests, the teachers. They're symbolized by the face, the head, right? And then below that, you have the warriors and the rulers. They're the arm the arms of society. Then you've got the legs, the guys who do a lot of the work, farmers, traders, merchants. Then you've got the laborers, the stinky feet. At the very, very end of this list, not even high enough to be the stinky feet are the outcasts. They don't even get to be on the guy. They are the lowest of the low. Even today, even today, this caste system is rigid and accepted widely in India. 
And you can, you can go on. I, I saw a video of, uh, of latrine cleaners or sewage, sewage, sewer cleaners. And the dude had a nice polo on and he would go and he would clean out sewers and he described his life and he talked about how he was an outcast. Looked like a normal guy to me, but he was the lowest of the low in society because of what he did. You are born into one of these castes. And you do not leave these castes. And the warriors and the rulers and the priests, known as the Brahmins, they fought and they tried to figure out they wanted to take that supreme place. Um, and the Brahmins won. The religious leaders won. Kind of shows the power of religion in, in societies. And which something that is just true universally for human beings. Uh, some of our most terrible institutions that we like to uphold. Really, when you get down to the nitty-gritty of it, so much of it is based on racism. And so what seems to have taken place is the lighter-skinned Aryans, as they came in and conquered northwest India, they set this up as a way to say, white guys up on top, darker skin, the darker your skin gets, the lower you become. We heard that before. Steve. The ones at the, I mean, the ones at the top, this is not, almost not even a, it's, it's not as much about wealth as it is about respect in society and place in society. I mean, your priests are going to be provided for. Um, your priests are not going to go hungry. They might not have a lot of wealth, but they're going to be taken care of. Your warriors, your rulers, obviously, are going to be really wealthy. Then you got your merchants. And so nobody pay, like there's no system, there's no government to pay the people of different structures. It's just totally ingrained in these people's minds that priests don't go hungry. If a priest wants something, he comes and he takes it. Um, I went to Cambodia. Now, Cambodia is Buddhist. Uh, the, the Buddha came from Hinduism, and so a lot of similarities there. Uh, but for instance, uh, the monks, the Buddhist monks would walk through the village, dirt poor village with their bowls out, and it was the responsibility of everyone in the village to come and fill those bowls with rice. Nobody nobody's has a gun to their head to do that. There's no government official that does that, but it's so ingrained in their minds. And so, way of works, the Brahmins devote themselves to the Vedas and the rituals. The warriors and political rulers uh, take advantage of the priests, and the priests can help them uh, reach salvation and and, and, and leave their sins behind. The merchants and the farmers can come to the priests. I mean, this is the hierarchy that we have. But here's the problem. Here's the problem. The top three, the top three castes can all participate in religious life. Can all have their sins forgiven by adhering to the religious order and but the feet can't and the outcasts can't in fact the first three casts you, you you walk around with a cord around your arm right here and it distinguishes you for who you are you are you are the creme de la creme you are a merchant you are a, you are a farmer they have a cord and so it's very very clear who is who The workers exist only to serve the upper class. Classes. Workers were impure. We've, we've heard this before. Workers, and especially outcasts, can defile one of the members of the upper class by touching them. We've heard this before. Yeah. Man, is racism just a part of the human heart or what? Judaism in Israel, 
thousands of miles away, the way of works in India, and they both come up with this idea that, hey, if you, you're a little darker skinned than me, if you touch me, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm defiled. The human heart is broken. Um, interesting thing about this, you know, uh, when Christianity came to India, I mean, what does Christianity think? What should Christianity think about something like this? We'll talk about it more later, but it's, it's abhorrent to us, and it should be. Um, Mother Teresa, she's Catholic, given all of her uh, you know, differences that we have, um, she came and she ministered to the untouchables, the poorest of the poor. And just kind of, a, uh, I hope, a glimpse of what Christianity is in comparison to this. Um, she is, a, she is a, a, a nun. She's a Christian. She loves Jesus. She loves these people. And, you know, in the Catholic Church, you kiss a lot. You know, you kiss a lot. Kiss your hand, kiss your hand. She has a spot on her forehead that the Pope couldn't kiss, priests can't kiss, you and I can't kiss. This spot on her forehead was reserved only for the untouchable class and the lepers and the diseased. They could kiss her right here. Nobody else could. That's a statement about, you're making a very clear statement about the true nature of what we've got going on here. Um, now, so when you have this class system set up, where do you want to be? Well, you want to be up here, right? You want to be up here. Um, and so, you want to move up. I'm a farmer. Farmer's life is hard. It's hard, sure harder than a priest. Uh, this is not in the Vedas, but reincarnation. The belief about reincarnation came up 1500 B.C. I want to move up the social ladder. And what is, this isn't in the Scripture, it's in the Veda. What does this support, though? How are you going to make sure the lower class stays lower class? Listen, I know you don't like it now, but guess what? When you die, if you're good, if you follow the rules, you can come back like me. And so, reincarnation very much supports this caste system that's very much at the very center of why it came about, why it came around. And we got a really crazy picture right here, right? You got the, got the what, 40-year-old guy, 30-year-old guy, and down, down, and he dies, and then it goes, there's death, and then here's some lady and comes out as a baby, okay? And the scary part is, what we got down here? What's this dude doing with all the animals? Well, it doesn't stop with human beings, it doesn't stop with human beings. Depending on your karma, we're going to talk about karma in a moment. Depending on how good you were, if you followed the rules, you did enough rituals, you listened to the priests, you did what was right, uh, you might come back as a higher class. You do what's wrong, you're going to come back as a lower class. If you're an untouchable, and you're a really, really smelly untouchable, what are you going to come back as? You might come back as a slug. And we in the West, there's this movement in America and the Western world to think, oh, Hinduism is such a spiritual thing and isn't reincarnation a beautiful experience? In Hinduism, reincarnation is the worst. Salvation in Hinduism is escaping reincarnation. Salvation is about leaving this whole system. I want to get to a place where I could just break free of this. This is called moksha. It's escaping the cycle of reincarnation. Who wants to suffer over and over and over and over and over again? Not us. We want to get out of here. So, karma. We know what karma is. We know what karma is. Karma supports reincarnation, which supports the caste system. If you are good, you will come back as a higher form. If you are bad, you will come back as a lower form. If you're a dog and you're a good boy, you might come back as an untouchable. An untouchable 
If you're a good boy and you adhere to the rituals, you might come back as a worker or a merchant or a soldier or a priest, a Brahmin. Or if you're a Brahmin and you're really, really good at what you do and you're very pure and you're sinless, you could escape this. But the opposite is also true. And the hard thing about reincarnation is one slip up is all it might take. Make you come back as a slug. So now, the way of works. Works, you got to do the right works, plus the caste system, plus reincarnation, plus karma. We must ask the question, who in the world can be good enough to escape this? Well, you know who can't escape this? How are you going to escape this if you're an untouchable and you can't go to the rituals anyway? Are you going to escape? No, you're not going to escape. In fact, this is how rigid the caste system is. You cross the caste line. If you're a servant, if you're a foot, and you steal one of those cords so everybody treats you like a, like a farmer, that's bad karma. You're coming back like a slug. If you try to help a lower caste person to become a higher class person, you incur terrible karma for both of you, and you'll come back as a slug. So who, who's, who's just out of luck? Beyond just everybody, because one sin might bring you back as a slug. Who's out of luck? Man, most of the people are out of luck. The foot, the untouchables, they can't do anything. To give you an idea about how one of the rituals that's so important to uh, Hinduism, even today, in this way of works, this is the Ganges River, one of the most important, significant, rather, rivers in the entire world. Very important, very holy river uh, for the Hindu faith. Um, one of the rituals that you could do to hopefully wash away your sins is come down, and this is a real picture. It looks like a painting, but see all these lights over here? I mean, look at all those people. All these thousands of people. If you come and you wash in the Ganges River and you do it the right way, it could wash your sins away. But you better not sin afterward. Self, I mean, the self-righteousness of this is just, it's called the way of works for Pete's sake. It's so heavy. The weight of this is so heavy that in desperation, as far as I could tell, in desperation, 35,000 people in desperation to try to escape their caste, when they die, are thrown into this river. 35,000 a year are thrown into this river. This is, one of, this is one of the most sacred rivers in the world, and it's also one of the most filthy rivers in the world. You've got dead bodies floating by all the time. You've got ashes from crematoriums floating down all the time. So, Servants, untouchables, I can't even make it. So what's going to happen? Well, in the 6th century AD, people kind of got their act together and realized, you know what, we don't really like this system as it is. We can't even do the rituals. And even when we show up to the rituals, the priests, at this point, you know, it's been, man, it's been like 2,500 years. The priests themselves have lost all meaning in these rituals. Nobody understood what was going on. And so this system was just kept going and going and going. And the people said, this isn't doing us any good. So there's a revolt against the priesthood. And words without meaning during the rituals, during the ways of wor way of works, was replaced by meaning without words. Words without meaning were replaced by meaning without words. 
This was based on commentaries of the Veda called the Upanishads. And this emphasized, the way of knowledge emphasizes deep spiritual reflection. Deep spiritual reflection. So if we can't get there by the way of works, maybe we, if we can't, if it's not what we do, maybe it's deep down inside us. Maybe salvation is, is way, way deep down in here. So the way of knowledge brought in these concepts of Brahman. Sounds like the priests, right? Connected to that. Brahman. This is God. This is impersonal, all-pervasive per, per, being. This is the force in Star Wars. This is where George Lucas got the force. It's in everything. It's flowing in and out. In fact, not only is it in everything, it is everything. Everything is God. Anything that is not God is just an illusion. It's just an illusion. Your bodies, your feelings, your emotions, your thoughts, your religions, your suffering is not real. It's just an illusion. This is what sent the Buddha, made the Buddha start Buddhism. Was it this idea in Hinduism that suffering isn't real? And he was a young priest, as the legend goes, and he, for the first time in his life, walked down the street and saw an old man dying and suffering and realize, no, that looks pretty real. The way of knowledge says this. Salvation, yeah, maybe you could do it by works, but man, we can't do it. I'm not good enough for that. So maybe it's way deep down inside us that if we concentrate, this is where we really get into that OM stuff, all that Western stuff. Yoga poses, right? You get into a yoga pose. Oh, you say your mantra and you're supposed to collapse in on yourself. And somewhere deep down in the, the nougat inside, the crunchy outside, there's some part of God inside of us. But it's not easy to find. It's not easy to find. In fact, the only way to really find release from reincarnation, moksha, to find salvation in Hinduism is to abandon everything. And I don't mean do it in some spiritual way where you don't care about your bank account as much as the next guy. I mean leave it all behind. Go in some cave somewhere and you might get it. the best thing you can do for your life to achieve salvation is to leave your kids at home, to leave your wife at home, to let them starve if need be, to renounce all attachments and go by yourself. And maybe at death, you will fully realize this God thing inside of you and then you become nothing. You become part of that. You become part of the force. Well, couldn't do the way of works, so a bunch of people said, hey, we don't like this anymore. Um, anybody have it within them to leave their kids behind to starve to death so they can do this? No. Not, not good. I saw one of us go, mm -hmm. no. No. Common people can't do this. This dude might be able to do it. I can't do it. So, 1,500, so 1,000 years later, the common people revolt again. We can't do works. We can't do devotion. We're out of here. We're out of here. This was spread by the southern part of India. Poets coming and spreading the idea that moksha can be found through loving a single God. Not the impossible way of works or unattainable secrets of the way of knowledge, 
But if you find one of our 333 million gods, you find the right one and you devote your life to that one, you might be able to be saved. This way introduced a whole pantheon of gods. Brahma is still there. Then you got, you might have heard Vishnu, Shiva, Indiana Jones. You might watch Indiana Jones, right? What is that one? The Temple of Something or Other where the guy's heart goes, right? Yeah, it's a good movie. Shiva, right? I mean, that's, that's that, that Indiana Jones movie, I'm not kidding, took place. The way of devotion. Shiva. I'm devoted to Shiva. That's how I'm going to achieve salvation. You'll never watch that movie the same again. This came from a passage in the New Scripture. So we had the Veda. Then we had commentaries on the Veda called the Upanishads. Then we have the Bhagavad Gita, which, which tells the story about an archer who led his army into battle? An archer. Remember, he's, what, what part is he on the caste system? He's an arm, right? That's what you were born into. He's born to lead an army and fight. Well, he feels really, really bad because his, his cousins are on the other side. And so he has this moral quandary. Am I supposed to kill? I know I'm in the caste and I'm in the arm. I've got to kill these guys, but those guys are my cousins. That can't be good for my karma. What in the world am I going to do? Am I going to, am I going to abandon my caste and my duty from the, the, the way of works? Or am I going to lose karma by killing my cousins? I don't know what to do. And then this dude named Krishna shows up. He's a god. And he says, listen, go kill your cousins. Doesn't matter. What you should really do is you should just devote yourself to me and I'll take care of you. So, the way of devotion is Hinduism today. You could do way of works. You see how squishy it is? Though? I mean, the way of works is still in there. You've got to do rituals, and, and you've got still the guys who, oh, you've got all that. So you have all of this going, and all of this combined, and all this stuff. But what you'll see most likely, if you go to India, is you will see the way of devotion. Well, that slide is goofy. There we go. Oh, my. Okay. Um, You'll see the way of devotion. Devoting yourself to a God. And so you'll see many statues like this. This good looking guy is Ganesh. He is a big deal in temples. You'll see him in most every temple. Um, you'll see family shrines. Um, I think I have a picture. Yeah. You'll see family shrines right here. And so the idea in the way of devotion is you've got a God somewhere over here. I don't know what it's supposed to be up here. Somewhere. You've got a God up here just like you got this guy right here. The God literally is inside these things. Ganesh is in here. Some God is over here. And to achieve salvation to be released from reincarnation, you put food in this little cup here. You light this little candle here. You pray. You give the God a bath. I'm not joking. You give the God a bath. You make sure he's comfortable, as comfortable as can be. And your whole family does this day after day after day after day. And if you show the proper amount of devotion, and if the God is happy with you, and if he's not having a bad day, when you die, he may let you advance. You feed him, you wash him, you water him, you clothe him, you pray to him, you go to temples with him in it, and you can hedge your bets. You've got 333 million gods. You can hedge your bets. Go to this one, go to that one, have a few. This is, this is uh, something that goes on in the temple. This is a worship service. When the priest and his assistant enter the worship area, 
music commences and the service begins in earnest. The first statue worshipped is always the elephant-headed god Ganesh. The priest has a bell on his left hand that he rings continuously. Ding dong, ding dong. When his right hand, he alternatively waves incense and oil lights in front of the statue. Way to wake him up. Ding dong, ding dong. We're coming. Then he places marks of flower paste on the god's forehead. There's no chanting in the routine. Next, may the, the, the service for the main god, the priest and his assistant, disappear for a moment behind the curtain and the music ceases and all eyes are fixed on the curtain. Then the curtain is drawn back suddenly and the priest stands before the god with a tall Christmas tree candelabra. The music resumes at full volume and the worshipers throw themselves prostrate to the ground. The overall effect is very dramatic. Then the priest completes the service for the main god, after which he continues through all of the gods in the temple, repeating the basic procedure for each. When the entire process is done, the music ceases and the worshipers line up to pass their hands through the fire and have their foreheads marked with ashes and flower paste. May God give us a righteous indignation that that type of worship is going on. This is a picture of, of that type of service. See the little candelabra thing up here. There's lost people. There's people going to hell. This little kid right here. He had no hope. These little kids here. Hoping that this little piddly shrine here can make a God love them. So what is a Hindu's hope in life and death? It's a good question in our evangelism day to day. What is your hope in life and death? I'll wake somebody up. Oh, oh, that's a weird question. The way it works, can I be good enough? Can the priests be good enough? Not only do I have to be good enough, but that priest has to say the right words. We have knowledge. Can I leave everything behind? Can I find God within me? Am I contemplative enough? The way of devotion, can I please my God? Which God will get me out? How many lives will it take for me to get this right? Will I ever break out of my caste? We're going to hear testimony of a a Christian who came out of Hinduism at the very end. But that's a terrifying system. Think about the poverty in India and you're the lowest of the low caste. You're scraping out sewage. You cannot do good enough. You don't even have a house to have a shrine in. They won't even let you in the temple. And you know that you have no hope. You can't be devoted to a God. So how many lives is it going to take you? You're never going to get out. And one of the scariest parts to me about Hinduism is this whole cycle of reincarnation and new life and new life and new life. Guess what? Even if you can claw your way up, reincarnation is not just for living people. Reincarnation is for the whole universe. So it could take you billions of lives to get out And then what happens? The next day, the universe might cycle over again and you're fed right back into the machine. There is no hope in that. There is no hope in that. So, 
What we need to do is we need, what I want to do when we talk about all these things, I would love to talk about how Jesus is better. And that is a, that is not a statement that people like to hear in our time, but that is what we believe. Jesus is better. Caste system. Hinduism says your value is determined by where you are in the social order. What does Jesus say? Jesus says, you, Christian, are God's glorious inheritance. We went over that in small group. Ephesians 1.18 says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, that you may know the hope in which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. What do you give the God who has everything? a rebellious person who comes to him through Jesus Christ and he thinks you are so precious that you are his inheritance. That's how he views you. Not as a foot, not as an untouchable. You are his glorious inheritance. What does Christianity have to say about racism? A lot. There is neither Jew nor nor Gentile, slave, nor free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. There's no priest and farmer and soldier and foot and untouchable. We are one in Christ Jesus. And at the very beginning of the book, you want to know how important racism is to God? How much he hates that? From the very first few pages, he says, human beings are made in my image. From the very beginning of the book. You're not a foot. You're not an untouchable. You're made in the image of God. And even if, even if, well, our, our society has head, shoulder, Stomach, legs, foot, untouchables. Where does God associate himself? Lowest of the low. When you fed the lowest of the low, you're feeding me. That's radically, that's radically different. That's radically different. Jesus is an untouchable. That's what that says. That's radically different. How about karma? Do good, become good. Do good, good things will come your way. What's that sound like? Don't read down, don't read down there. What's that sound like that I never talk about, but every single second? The prosperity gospel. Prosperity gospel is karma. Prosperity gospel is Hinduism, is not Christianity. Prosperity gospel preached in some of our biggest, our, our biggest churches in America that aren't even churches are preaching there's a Joel Osteen quote. I forgot about that. Oh, that guy. He's never going to let me sleep. Keep a good attitude and do the right thing even when it's hard. When you do that, you are passing the test. And God promises you your marked moments, your blessings are on their way. What does that sound like? He's a Hindu. That's what it sounds like. Makes me think he's a Hindu. Makes me think he believes in karma. Makes him think that you give me enough money and you might make it to the next level. That's, oh, makes me sick to my stomach. Do good, be good. Do good, become good. Do good, get good is karma. What does Christianity say? Well, if that's the system, Christianity says no one does good, no, not one. Romans 3.10. What does Christianity say about works? For it is by grace, the free gift you have been saved, through faith. And it's not of yourselves. It's not of works. So that no one will boast. That's radically different. Is that better? Is Jesus better? Are you, how thrilled are you that you were born at this time and at this place that you can be a Christian and you were not born in the slums of New Delhi 
in this system that you can never break out of. How thrilled are you? How much should we praise God and thank him for that? Karma. Do good, become good. Do good, good things will happen to you. Jesus tells us, really? This is how God works. The rain falls on the just and the unjust. What does that mean? Bad people get good things sometimes. Good keep people get bad things lots of times. Nobody knows any billionaires who are scumbags. Do you know? They're, that doesn't exist, does it? Yeah. No, karma is broken. Karma does not work. This is what works. This is what works. My sin, I cannot deal with. I deserve to be punished for it. I deserve to go to hell for it. I deserve to be a slug for it. I can't be good enough. I know that. Like, that doesn't seem like a controversial statement to me. So what I need is I need somebody to take my sin away. Washing in a river is not going to do it. I know that. Some ritual isn't going to do it. I need somebody to perform surgery on me. I need somebody to take this sin away. And it needs to be somebody who's not like me, not a sinner like me. It can't be some priest. That might be a little bit better than me, but really we're all slugs. It can't be a priest. It can't be some angel. What does it need to be? It needs to be a perfect being. And the weight of my sin against a perfect God is infinitely heavy. It needs to be somebody whose shoulders could bear that much burden. It needs to be a God-man. A real one. It needs to be Jesus. Karma? No, not karma. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For our sake he made Jesus to be sin who knew no sin that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Karma hates grace. Karma is about getting what you deserve. Jesus deserved perfect heaven, perfect comfort, and he became sin for us. Is that better? That's better. Is that better? I hope I'm right. Go like this, please. Yeah, that's better. My goodness, that's better. Reincarnation. Existence is a miserable cycle of... Re wait, 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 wait. Yeah, I thought I had something else. Okay. Prosperity gospel. You think karma, do good, get good. How about you ask Paul? Was Paul a good guy? How about you ask Peter? How about you ask John, boiled in oil, sent off to a slave colony? How about you ask Jesus? Do good, be good? Do good, get good? No. No. For us, it's suffering now for glory later. Man, I hate, I hate the prosperity gospel. Oh, it makes me mad. Reincarnation. Existence is a miserable cycle of rebirth and suffering that goes on forever. Even if you break out, the universe is going to cycle through again and you're going to have to do it all over again. Jesus, what is Jesus? It's appointed man to die once and after that face judgment. I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. When you die, Christian, you will live. Forget this cycle of trying to get it better. Jesus says, you're in me. You will die and you will live forever. Hebrews says he sacrificed once for all and now he is seated at the right hand of the Father. It's done. This is your only life on this earth. If you are in Christ, you are out and you are with God forever. You want to escape suffering? If you are in Christ, that day is coming and there's nothing you can do to stop it. Isn't that fabulous? Is that better than reincarnation? Oh, man, praise God. <sighs> Suffering in Hinduism is maya, is an illusion. <sighs> and really, what it seems to me is it, salvation in Hinduism is an escape into nothing. It's an escape away from yourself. It's an escape into the force. It's an impersonal force. You don't do impersonal things. Don't, you know what I mean by that? 
It doesn't do anything. It's like a fog. Fog is an impersonal thing. It doesn't have anything. It doesn't have any... Des- That's just getting... It's just saying, I would rather be nothing. That's what Hinduism is. I would rather just be nothing than be where I am now. Suffering is not an illusion. Doesn't that hurt you? You know that time you really suffer? What's the worst thing, suffering you've ever gone through in your life? Think about it. Does that hurt you for somebody to say, hey, get over it. It's an illusion. How does that make you feel? Anybody ever said that to you? Man. This is what Jesus says. Hey, your suffering is not an illusion. Your suffering is due to sin. He says, don't worry, I got your back. That that sin that caused your suffering will be punished. He says, either on my back or whoever caused your suffering will punish, will be punished for eternity, one or the other. But your sin, the sin that caused your suffering will be brought to justice. Is that better? Is that better? Is it better that we don't have some nameless God who tells us, don't worry about suffering, it's not real anyway? Or do we have a God, is it better to have a God who has suffered? Philippians 2.8, And being found in human form, He humbled Himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. That's the guy I want to take care of my suffering. Jesus says, suffering is real, but I'm going to resurrect it for your good and His glory. I don't know how that's going to work, but it's going to work. And Jesus says, suffering is real, but I have defeated suffering, and it will be gone one day. He will wipe away every tear from our eyes. There will be no more death, no more crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. way of works, way of knowledge. Be good and you will receive release from a reincarnation. Be good and you will be good. Well, we are all spiritually dead. Look deep within yourself and find God. God better not be in me or a part of me because that means God's a real scumbag and I can't trust Him. Are you with me? God inside of us. No, I, I don't resonate with that. I resonate with Ephesians 2, 3. We were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Way of devotion. Be devoted to a particular God. Make sure you please that God. Make sure you earn that God's love. No. Idols of stone cannot do anything. They cannot save anything anyone. They cannot save me and they cannot save you. There is one God, the Creator of heaven and earth, and He does not share glory. Man, they're getting at it down there. Why does Jesus love you? Because you're devoted to Him? Because you feed Him, you wash Him, you pray to Him? Does He love you because you're awesome to Him? No, He loves you because He's awesome. Does He love you because you're lovable to Him? No, He loves you because He is all loving. Man, we get that wrong so much. There's nothing in me that makes God love me. He loves me because he is love, loving and he loves loving scumbags like me and making us new. That's why God does it. Don't get that backwards. Hinduism and the gospel. We talked about it earlier. Difficulty in missions. Hindus are super generous, uh, super kind. They are super agreeable people. And so when we first sent missionaries over there, we said, man, 
revival happening in India. And what was actually happening was these really nice people saw some Westerners and they came and Westerners in this caste system, we're all way, way high in a caste system. And so somebody's way higher than me comes up and says, hey, let me tell you about Jesus. Jesus sounds pretty good. Yeah, I'll throw him on the pile. So we've come to realize that. We've come to realize Hindus think differently than us. Hinduism is not linear thinking. You know, we think A plus B equals C. That's how we think. Hindus think in circles. Why would they do that? Reincarnation, right? Get in this cycle. So Hindus think this way. So what, you, what that means is uh, one plus one equals two for us. I'm not trying to be mean. One plus one can equal carrot in Hinduism. That's the kind of thinking. There's no objectivity to this. Very, very little objectivity to it. So do you see the difficulty in coming to somebody and saying, Jesus is the only way to salvation. See how difficult that is? You're making an objective statement, a factual statement, a one plus one equals two statement, and it doesn't really fit in their mindset. You're saying, wait, I have to get rid of all my other gods? See how difficult that is? Pray for our missionaries. Pray for our missionaries. We're going to hear from a guy in a moment, like I said. and he's, he's, He was very afraid. Hinduism is based on fear. Fear of mad gods. What if I make my god mad? Is he going to save me? Fear of mean spirits. There's this idea of spirits are everywhere and there's evil spirits. They're very terrified of evil spirits. Fear of never-ending rituals and requirements. Fear of billions and billions of reincarnations. It's awful. Fear of karma. Jesus is better. Fear of mad gods. Jesus loves you. What can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus? Can disease, can famine, can sword? No, nothing. Can you, can your sin separate you from the love of God? No. In Hinduism, you forget to wash the God and He might not let you go to heaven. Jesus will always love you. Fear of mean spirits? What does Jesus do to mean spirits? Get in those pigs. Shut your mouth, get in those pigs. Salvation in Christianity is based on relationship, not never-ending rituals and requirements. Not billions of reincarnations or fear of kar- or karma. Jesus makes us right before God with His one righteous life. That's all it took. Sai Anand. This isn't him. This is just another picture. But Sai Anand. Your tithes helped pay for missionaries to meet Sai, share the gospel with him, and this is part of his testimony. My life as a Hindu was torture. I'd get up in the morning, go to temple, and perform rituals I wasn't able to connect with. I'd look at the idol telling myself the God it represents is real, but knowing it isn't. I slowly realized there wasn't concrete evidence for a lot of the stories and beliefs behind Hinduism. Many people continue in the faith because that's what they've been taught from their parents, but I had my doubts. By God's grace, during college, I heard about true freedom, true liberation offered from the true God, Jesus Christ. He has changed my life and beliefs about everything. Even with all my doubts, Though this is what I, he goes on to say, what I used to believe as a Hindu. What a testimony. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome? So, that is, that is Hinduism. Um, very dark religion, a very harmful religion, a very lots of hurt people. A billion, almost a billion Hindus in darkness being tortured. Any questions? Comments? Concerns? All right. Hey, I hope you enjoyed this. Okay. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it gives us a heart for the lost around us and ways to pray for our missionaries and I hope it makes us just see again how awesome, how Jesus is better. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. That's right. Thank you, Mindy. 
Exactly right. Those Hindus right down the street. Right down the street. What should we be doing about that? Anything else? All right. Uh, Thank you for coming. Let's pray, and uh, we'll be dismissed. Father, uh, thank you for this opportunity to just see how glorious Jesus is uh, in comparison to whatever else is out there. Um, Father, I I pray that that our missionaries are bold and, and, and... are willing to endure and uh, suffer along with these people and uh, until they see fruit. Father, I pray that you give them fruit, give them courage. Father, I uh, pray for the international students right down the street. Father, would you, uh, would you be merciful to us and bless us with, um, with a heart for them? And God, we would love to see them come here and hear about Jesus and be saved. Father, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys. We will... Uh, We'll be on Buddhism next week, God willing. God willing. Go down and watch the Iwana kids get awards. That's what I'm going to do.